Hello, and welcome to a special bonus episode of Tabletop Bellhop Live Guest Check-In. Getting the lowdown on H2O with Phil Vecchione. Coming to you from Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, your RPG maitre d', answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. Today we are joined by a very special guest. I would like to welcome Phil Vecchione from Buffalo, New York to our guest check-in. Phil is here to talk to us about an RPG he's working on called Hydro Hacker Operatives, or H2O. Welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, Phil. Howdy. It's, uh, it's nice to be here. I, I love the bell. I'm uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna wind up sneaking that on to misdirected mark at some point. Nice. We can we can definitely sneak you a uh, at the very least the sound effect if not a physical bell on. Uh, oh on no no! Sets. I'm getting a physical. Oh, I'm getting a go. physical you... bell. I'm gonna no, terrorize I... him with it. Ding, ding. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I had to buy a second one because we had someone show up in my chat room that was really upset that on the pile of games behind us, there wasn't a bell. They're like, there's a shot of games with no bell in it. It's just not right. So I had to get a second <laughs> bell. So I have one to ding while we're doing the show and one so people can see And then see one a right bell. back there. Yeah, yes. there we go. There are people who are talking about how they love to play Find the Bell in all the, fo- in all the photos from Instagram yes. and Twitter. <laughs> All right, so uh, I'd love awesome. to say hi to everyone in the lobby, but right now that's just us. So thank you very much, Angie Games, for being our moderator for uh, that one skinny seahorse bot. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Welcome, all you bots. Commander Root, I'm sure you'll be here later. <laughs> and while it's Thursday today, you can normally join us here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. <laughs> and now Tabletop Gaming Weekly where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit the Bellhop's tabletop? Every week, I like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and other cool gaming stuff going on. I think this segment is fantastic for letting our listeners know what kind of games we are into and what we're currently excited about. Now, the thing is, I just did this yesterday on yesterday's episode, so everyone already knows what's going on with me. So what I want to know is what games hit your tabletop this week, Phil? Yeah, this is so this will be a um, this will this will actually be a longer list because I was kind of like on a bender for like the last uh, like last six days. So um, it was all RPGs, but I started last Thursday uh, on a six day run of games. So I played uh, so I ran uh, some Fate Accelerated um, on Thursday night for my Thursday night game group. And um, that is my. that's a setting that I'm working on with a couple of people called Long Live the Queen. Uh, so uh, we were playing, we were kind of test driving plus just playing that. Uh, so that was cool. And then um, over the weekend was Gauntlet Con. So uh, the Gauntlet uh, RPG community had their online convention. Uh, so mm-hmm. I ran a bunch of games for that. So I ran uh, two sessions of Hydro Hackers on Friday nice. and Sunday. And I ran some uh, Turning Point on um Saturday evening, and uh, that's a another game that I'm uh, that I'm developing, co-developing um, with my co-host from uh, Pandas Talk Games, Senda. Nice. And then Monday uh, on Pandas Talk Games, we did an AP of uh, Dungeon World with the Legacy Weapon, okay. which is a one-on-one, uh, which is one-on-one uh, supplement I wrote for playing Dungeon World, and then Tuesday. Uh, and you guys were there for that. Uh, we played some new Monera that was mostly serious until Chris okay. kind of ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's so, what, yeah. how many games are you developing right now? Is that two or three? Uh, it's uh, well, Hydra Hackers technically isn't done, so that's one. Yeah. Uh, Long live the Queen. Turning Point. Uh, Legacy Weapon. I wrote a while ago. So that's okay, done. so that's old. That, All right, that's done. That's old and out. Um, so that one's done. Uh, yeah, that's like yeah, it's like three. There's like three in the hopper right now. Like one's like Turning Point's almost well. Hydro Hackers is out in Ashcan. Mm-hmm. Turning Point is nearly done, and I'm, we're gonna start writing the manuscript um, in November. And Long of the Queen is like on the beginning of its journey, so it's more like a 2020. Um, it's more like a 2020 release. Like it's just okay. starting to get played now and kind of tinkered with. 
Excellent. All right. So now you talk so, about running games at the uh, at Gauntlet Con. Do you do you get to play games at these cons? Do you even try to play games at cons anymore? Uh, I I did. Um, so it depends on the con. So for Gauntlet Con, um, because it, like I was home and like my life was mixed into being online, uh, I just played in one game uh, on Saturday morning, and then like. Uh, when I go to other cons, so like you, if you like, you saw me at Queen City Conquest, mm-hmm. and I was I ran like all the games um, there because that's my home convention. Like people are, it's basically people come into my house, so I just right. like I'm gonna host and I'll run a bunch of games. But when I go to other cons, I absolutely play um, other games. I love actually playing um, other games. When I uh, like, I always book a day where I don't uh, don't run games and I don't right. do seminars, and then I just go gaming. Awesome. Excellent. All right, based on the other list of what you just played, I do have to ask. I know we'll get to the interview part later. Do you play anyone else's games or just your own? Uh, yeah, I know that's so bad. No, <laughs> I actually do play. I actually do play and run other games. So um, I just so my Long Live the Queen game, that group, uh, we had just finished playing um, Dungeon Crawl Classics. Okay. So we did that for a while. And on Sundays, every other Sunday, so when uh, so on my Sundays, I either run um, Scum and Villainy, okay, or I play in Chris Nizak's game, uh, which right now is um, uh, Monster of the Week. Oh, I forgot of all those games. I also ran Action Movie World on go. Sunday because Chris because Chris wasn't feeling well, so I subbed in and ran Action Movie World. And that's that not game. yours. Uh no, that's not <laughs> mine either. No, I actually do love actually playing other people's games. I love other people's games. Uh, it's just that. Um, it, for cons, like I always have to run like to well, promote the company. I've always mm-hmm. got to run some of my own stuff. Uh, but personally, like at home, I actually like to not run my stuff most of the okay. time. Fair. Now, when it comes to uh, to games playing or running, uh, do you stick exclusively to uh, independent games these days, or do you still dabble in some uh, some mainstream stuff? I would say it's pretty much mostly. Um, it's pretty much more indie style games. I'm not playing um, like I haven't played Dungeons and Dragons in a while. Um, I played for a little while when it first came out, and uh, but yeah, most of my times mostly like mostly indie games. Yeah, DCC is kind of a mix. That's that's almost trad, almost indie, kind of walking that line. Yeah, I, I mean, I actually really liked. I actually really liked DCC. D, I I liked it way better than I thought I would. I kind of at first did it on a lark. I was like, I'm buying this giant ass book and all these crazy <laughs> dice. Um, and uh, I mean, I got it right. Like it's it's meant to evoke that old. Like it's meant to evoke that feeling when you're a kid, mm-hmm. right? Like it gives you even weirder dice than you're used to. Yes. Right. So like, I you totally feel like you're a kid again because you're like, you're I don't know dice. which one's the twenty four. Like, yep. you know. So yeah, but actually, once we started playing it, like when we we played a couple of uh, modules of it, I was like, "Wow, this is actually like a really like this is a really smart version cool. of D twenty." Yeah, I had a lot I, of respect for it by the time we finished playing it. That's awesome. Yeah, I backed the fourth edition Kickstarter, so I've got the big shiny book with the gilded edges and the oh the yeah page uh, whatever you call them bookmarks built into it and everything. I've read it. I just haven't had a chance to get a group together to play it yet. I, I absolutely, I absolutely for DCC recommend um, getting their modules. Like, yeah, I've got their, a pile. So. Yeah, their modules are so good. Nice. Now, each episode, we look to answer one of your, one or more of your gaming or game night questions. You can send your questions, questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or you can head over to the webpage, tabletopbellhop.com, and click on Ask the Bellhop. Today, we're mixing it up a bit. That's right. Instead of answering your questions, we're the ones going to be answering the, asking the questions of Phil. The main thing we're here to talk about is this new game called Hydro Hacker Operatives, or H2O. <laughs> I was actually covering up all your faces with my own copy uh, version of it, so I have the stream. So <laughs> there we go. I have the stream, so I win. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, but let's let's start off with the most basic question. Now that we've all flashed our uh, flashed our various copies of the uh, game around, <laughs> what the most basic question? What is H two O? Sure. So uh, Hydro Hacker Operatives, or H two O for short, or Hydro Hackers, which is really from a branding perspective a bad idea to have that many names for your game. But anyway, mm-hmm. um, Hydro Hackers is a uh, tabletop role playing game. It's powered by the Apocalypse game. 
And uh, the premise of the game is that you play hydropunk Robin Hoods stealing water from corporations to keep your neighborhood alive. Nice. Nice. Okay. Now, one question I want to get out of the way. Did H2O, which is hydro hacker operatives, not necessarily water, come? Did it, where, did the, where did that come from? Did you, did you say, I need to have H2O and this is how I'm going to make the name fit? Or did you throw the H2O on after you, you'd named it? No, so I definitely wanted the game to be called H2O because um, all of the, um, when I first started writing it, all of the, uh, the directory that it was in was just called H2O. And um, I didn't know anything else because it was just the water game for a the little water. while. Is this that and, plumbing uh, game? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is, it the, is this the plumbing game? Yeah, I'll, I'll, <laughs> we can talk about that in a bit. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was for a while, it was just called the water game. And I just like, I, for shorthand, obviously just called it H2O. And then we were sitting around one night and a friend of mine, Dave Mondello, um, who was like really good with naming stuff. Like he just, like all of a sudden he was like hydro hacker operatives. And we were all like, holy, Ooh, like, yeah. like we all like started clapping and it was like, okay, well that's the name of the game now. That's nice. So. Nice. So I own the ash can of hydro hacker operatives, this right here. So what I'd like to know, I'd like to ask definition Panda. Can you help us out? Oh, yeah. What exactly is an ash can? So an ash can is um, a version of a game that's not necessarily complete. Um, and you've kind of put it together on a low budget. So like you haven't spent okay. a lot on artwork. Um, you kind of just like throw it together to kind of get it out into the world so that uh, people can try playing it. Um, and you make it um, price wise, um, pretty low price to make it accessible. Okay. Like you really like the goal is to get it out and have people experiencing it. Now, is another goal of an ash can to raise the funds to produce the full version, or is that just secondary? Um, yeah, that's, that, I mean, for me, it's definitely secondary. Like for me, well, I guess, so the answer is yes and no. Not the, not the funds from selling the ash can is okay. going to work, but what, what I'm hoping will happen is that the game will spread, right? Like the game's right. priced really low, like five bucks for the PDF, so that I'm hoping what will happen is a bunch of people will try it, pick it up, play it, and look at it so that later when we come back to do the okay. full version, people will be like, oh, of course I know what Hydro Hackers is. Like, right. you know, I kicked I kicked around the ash can. So that is uh, that is the goal. So indirectly, it, it will help, hopefully help to fund the, the final version of the game. Okay, cool. So I love the term Hydropunk Robin Hoods. Can you break that down a bit for us? Like, what does this mean for the theme and tone of the game? Like, everyone knows cyberpunk, steampunk, and now there's diesel punk, and I've seen rocket punk and other games. But until your game, I've never heard of hydropunk. Right. I'm pretty sure I might have accidentally made that up. I hope um, so. That's awesome. Yeah. So hydropunk is um, so hydropunk is the idea like this game. So this game was originally derived um, from a cyberpunk uh, game that I was working on, and the idea is that um, it's a future where uh, water is the the rarest commodity, and that um, everything about the world kind of revolves around the control of water, uh, and punks then are like the ones who kind of buck the system to uh, you know to make. Uh, you know, to, to change things. Um, and when we say Robin Hoods, um, that implies a couple things. So one, it implies that you're going to steal water because, um, again, if you're, you know, if you're looking back at the cyberpunk roots of this, like you would steal data in a, like a traditional mm -hmm. cyberpunk game. But I kind of liked the idea, like, well, what if you had to steal like a ridiculous amount of water? Like, and how would you even do that? Um, and so it's Robin Hoods because um, this game also implies that you are the good guys. Like, unlike a cyberpunk game where it's like, hey, we do jobs for cash and to look awesome and buy more cyberware, um, you're doing jobs because your neighborhood needs water to stay alive. So you're the good guys. Nice. Um, yeah. So that's it. Cyber, the Hydropunk and Robin Hood. So I played Hydro Hackers. I've also played another one of your games, Rocker Boys and Vending Machines. Uh -huh. And based on the conversation you just went through, you're obviously a big fan of all things cyberpunk. I, I am. I, um, I, so I was always a sci-fi over fantasy kind of kid. So I was a mm -hmm. Star Wars, Star Trek, um, all of that over 
or over Lord of the Rings and things like that. But in my freshman year of high school, um, a friend of mine who was an actual computer hacker um, <laughs> uh, gave me a copy of Neuromancer by William nice. Gibson. And like that was it. Like I read Neuromancer and I then was like totally um, caught up in all like the entire that entire literary movement for a while. Like I just loved um, Sterling and Gibson and like all of those guys. And so uh, I played a ton of um, Cyberpunk uh, 2013, mm-hmm. the box set and 2020. Nice. The um, I played a ton of that. I tried to play Shadowrun, but. Um, I always just went back to playing cyberpunk. Like I liked the mechanics a lot more um, in cyberpunk. So yeah, I like, I have always had a love. I've always had a love for cyberpunk and um, yeah, that's how Hydra hacker started. Like I tried making a cyberpunk game and, um, and then we kind of drifted it and kept taking the cyber out of it until it was like, Oh, this game isn't, this game's more not cyberpunk anymore. So I guess it's hydropunk. We actually, we actually even had a note last night that we were going to make sure and ask you whether or not uh, you approved of Elves and Dragons in your Cyberpunk uh, to be uh, sh- Shadowrun, or if you preferred a more uh, more science based Cyberpunk. Um, my so my preference is I do actually like the more science based, but we did for a while, like when I was in high school. So again, we we tried and failed at playing uh, Shadowrun, like we just <laughs> could not uh, get into the system. So uh, we actually just made our own. Um, version of it by using uh, the Palladium system. We just oh, mixed pal- we just mixed Palladium fantasy with ninjas and Wait. super spies. <laughs> so you didn't like the Shadowrun system, so you replaced it with Palladium. <laughs> like, all right, we were not fair. one you we expect weren't big to hear Palladium. We weren't big Palladium fans in Windsor. <laughs> see, yeah. see, being in Windsor, Palladium's like the home game. Like Eric Widget comes to Windsor to run games. Like, so there's there's a love hate relationship with Palladium here in Windsor. My my on ramp was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Well, that's so, that's good. That's, right. Okay. I, I can't yeah. complain about yep. that one. Or if you said Robotech was a great game, I can't complain about that one either. I mean, I I actually drew the line. Um, so we, I, I played Palladium Fantasy, I played Heroes Unlimited, wow. um, Ninjas and Super Spies, Beyond the Supernatural, Robotech, and then like we tried playing Rifts, and like that was for me that was too the far. moment where I like jumped the shark, and yeah. I was like, I can't yeah. do like I can't do this, like I I don't understand like, and I know there's tons of Rifts fans, but like. I I just I like I couldn't yep. make the final yep. the final leap on board. No, I yep. understand I, completely. Uh, when you're talking about uh, the fiction you like, I mean, obviously you mentioned Gibson and Sterling. Um, do you go into uh, like a Neil Stevenson, a Rudy Rucker, Cory Doctorow? Um, uh, yeah, like I, I'm Cory Doctorow's awesome. Um, uh, yeah, Neil. I I mean, I love you know. I mean, I love me some Snow Crash, right? Snow for me, like I love Snow Crash, but Snow Crash is also somewhat of a satire on uh on yep. cyberpunk so uh while i like it i mean i also like it's a, it's a little more tongue-in-cheek yep um uh i like uh, morgan so I, I i love richard k morgan um so altered carbon yep um i love i love that series and i love his other sci-fi stuff too so 13 was uh was really good yeah i sadly do not read um as many like novels anymore like i wind up like either writing or reading games that like i actually read far less novels than i used to i i'm i mean exactly the same route for a while the kindle kick started me into reading again but there's just so much other media and it's not it's like it's not like tv's replaced it there's just not enough time to read being up too late as it is so reading in bed is on the way Mm -hmm. of the uh, wind yeah reading in bed is just the few minutes before my head hits the page of the book and then i'm like (laughs) oh uh uh-huh yep oh so Sean and I, Sean and I have both played H two O. I own a copy of the Ashcan. He's got the PDF, and I picked up the uh, Ashcan at Queen City Conquest. Mm-hmm. So, and Queen City Conquest for those people who may not have caught our uh, our special episode was a great con in Buffalo, New York. It happens annually. Uh, next year, it's going to be happening in July, uh, and we strongly recommend it. Uh, it's on our uh, to do list. We're, we're hoping yes. the uh, we're hoping it's. The new, the new dates aren't going to be too problematic because we're getting into uh, post-Origins time there, but hopefully. Yeah, plus my daughter's birthday's in July, so I'm hoping it's not near the beginning of July. Would definitely like to make it back down there. That was a fantastic con. Yeah, I, I mean, I love, uh, I love, I love QCC. It's uh, my home con. Um, 
a lot of people that I'm really good friends with and several of my, I think at least half of the organizers are in in one or more of my game groups. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I love it. I, I'm, I was a little sad to see it move from September to July because September was like this really nice, like, like done with origins kind of yeah. recover and bam, mm-hmm. like QCC. But I also know that it's going to like, um, the reason it's moving is because it's going to go to a new v- venue right. that wasn't going to be available at that time. And the new venue is like really cool. And I believe it's going to be like less expensive. Yeah. So fair enough. So let's get into some of the specifics about the mechanics in Hydro Hackers. So here at Tabletop Bellhop, we want to be a resource for new gamers as well as longtime players. And we tend to focus more on the board game side of tabletop gaming, though we do talk about both, obviously. So for our fans who probably have no idea what you're talking about when you say it's powered by the apocalypse, could you get into what that means? Yeah, sure. So um, powered by the apocalypse uh, means that um, the rules for Hydro Hackers follow the same um, design um, structure and kind of and similar mechanics uh, as the original game that a lot of these um, were based on. So I, I guess I'll do a better job of clarifying that. But years ago, there was a game that came out called Apocalypse World, written by uh, Vincent and McGay Baker. And um, it was a very kind of different take on how role-playing games uh, were structured. And so it uh, relied primarily on these mechanics called moves, which were these kind of proscribed um, like little rules bundles. Like you just play, like you have a conversation until you do something that triggers one of these like little rules bundles. And then like, it tells you exactly what to do. So like, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, like when you want to attack somebody roll plus strength and then, you know, you roll 2d6, you add your strength. And then based on the numbers moves, always break things into um, three parts. So 10 or higher. That's awesome. Like you get what you want, probably a little bit more seven to nine. You get what you want. But probably, but at a cost. So usually there's something that comes like a, a little bad that goes with it, and at a six minus, um, the GM decides what happens, okay. which doesn't necessarily mean you fail, but it means that the GM has their own fixed list of things that they can do, and uh, they kind of pick one that's uh, that fits the um, that fits what's going on in the game, and uh, makes that happen. So anyway, Apocalypse World comes out, and a whole bunch of people start using that same model for building more games. So Apocalypse World leads to Dungeon World, which is probably the uh, sometimes more popular in recognition than Apocalypse World is. Um, But then they become like a series of these games, and it's been going on now for a couple of years. Um, Mm -hmm. I say a couple. I think it's probably like five or six years now, right? Um, Where designers are basically um, using that same structure. And I say same structure because like when you write in a Powered by the Apocalypse game, it's not so much a core system like uh, 5e or fate or anything, but it's more like a design aesthetic. Like I'm going to have moves, I'm going to have principles and agendas, uh, but I have to go kind of make all those myself. Okay. So I've been listening to you, Chris and Bob on Misdirected Mark for many years now. And through these years, I've heard you try move through, sometimes get past many different game systems. And there's always the hot system of the moment with you guys. And for a long time, that was Fate. And I'm just wondering, what made you choose Powered by the Apocalypse and not Fate, say, for Hydro Hackers? So the funny part is the original version of Hydro Hackers was written in Fate. (laughs) Um, So what happened was um, I started developing the game in Fate. uh, And the Ashcan doesn't have it in there, but I have this... um, subsystem for hacking water which is actually very board game ish um uh, it involves cards and it involves like a a whole bunch of things and i was running it in a i was running it at gen con in fate and the table like i look at the table in the middle of the game and i've got all my cards for the hydro hack stuff Mm -hmm. and then i've got like fate aspects written all over the table and fate tokens all over the place and i'm like holy like this game's a beast to run like there's so much stuff going on here uh and that's where i was like oh i should really consider that that this game may be suited to a better um to a different system i shouldn't say better system it would be better better suited for a different system and the other thing that um that powered by the apocalypse does is it gives you a little more control on tuning the tone of the game because fate games in general um, are a little more uh, up 
They're a little more, you know, because your players are dramatic, uh, competent uh, players. And so uh, I wanted something slightly grittier. And grit is a thing that you can tune a lot better uh, as you build a Powered by the Apocalypse game. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it, it did start. It, I did love <laughs> I, I still love me some fate. But, um, yeah, it started there. Yeah, I think if you'd done it in Fate, it would have been Hydro, uh, instead of Hydro Punk, it would have been Hydro Hero Operatives, Hydro Heroes. Yeah, right? <laughs> to get like, the I, punk, it, you kind of needed the, the PBTA there. Well, I, what's really funny is there's a piece of artwork, and I think it's actually in the book, too. There's a piece of artwork I bought um, early on, because I just, I like when I'm uh, designing a game to just buy some concept art pieces. They kind of help me focus. Um, and there's a picture of the plumber, and I'm looking to see if I put her, yep. She's in there on page 36. Um, so Flux the plumber, um, she has this monstrous wrench, right? Like the wrench is like seven feet tall, right? Yeah, there it is. That That's Flux. And um, for Fate, that's like perfect, right? right? For Fate, that's like that character makes perfect sense. It actually doesn't make that much sense in Hydra Hackers. No. But again, we're ba- we're making an ash can, so we didn't buy another piece of artwork. We just, you know, cycle the stuff we got. Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the reasons I wanted to ask about Powered by the Apocalypse, so Sean doesn't have a lot of experience with modern RPGs. Like, I think the last thing we played together before going to QCC was FASA Star Trek, and I think before that it was Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay First Edition. And I know Sean found PBTA to be uh, rather intrusive. Uh, maybe Sean can explain a little better. And, and I, I, we, we use the term intru- intrusive, and, I, and I've used it myself, and I don't know if that's really the best term. I just found it uh, a different, and again, this is, this is my lack of experience with the modern games, but finding myself being sort of forced into um, making actions based on parts of the character sheet. Uh, I know a lo- most of my, my experience, especially the way... Uh, Mo runs his games. He runs very sandbox games. So even if we are playing Dungeons and Dragons or Warhammer, you're not necessarily, you know, oh, well, I'm swinging a sword. So on page 47 of the rule book, I need to roll 2d6 because my sword is six feet long and weighs this much. It's really more of a, uh, okay, roll and I'm going to roll and there's a plus six to the DM's roll. Whoever wins, wins. Um, and, and so I, I found it a little on the jarring side just because of this, that difference to move into the uh, the PBTA where you're you're really sort of shoehorning everything in and not in a bad way but but shoehorning yourself into this this these concepts and very specific uh, moves and actions. I yeah I uh, I can speak directly to this. Um, so the feeling that you're having is something that we talk about on Misdirected Mark, um, where we talk about levels of the game. Um, and so uh, when we talk about that, I'll try, to, I'll try to explain it briefly. But when we play a game, we kind of ex- in a role playing game, we, we kind of exist in different levels of the game. So um, at the like at the beginning level it, or lowest level, deepest level, we never agreed on what that adjective was. Uh, but the character level, that's where you're like thinking about your character. And then there's a game level that kind of sits above that, which is the what dice do I roll? What modifier do I have? And so with a game like Dungeons and Dragons, you're, you stay, you often stay more rooted in the player level and you occasionally pop up for like, oh, let me roll my, you know, let me roll my D20 and add seven. I got a 13 and then like, whoop, back down, right? Like I hit or miss, I'm back down in the player level. But Powered by the Apocalypse games have, um, they kind of push some of the work that normally like a GM would do onto the players like so for instance um on a seven to nine roll uh oftentimes you're asked to pick something uh that goes wrong right and that's normally something that in a more traditional or an older role-playing game would be pushed off to the gm but now it's um now it's pushed onto you like for instance uh in hydro hackers there's a move called come across which is when you want to use your personality to get somebody to do something. So on a 10 plus, it just works, right? Like, okay, you, you know, um, you're going to let me into the back room so I can get, you know, in on this water auction. And on a 10 plus, it works fine. On a six minus, the GM will pick from a list, from the, a list in the move of whether, first, whether or not you actually succeed or not. And then what's the attitude of the person. But on a seven to nine, 
uh, the player has to pick the attitude of the person. And so now it puts a little bit of that GMing load onto the player. So that feeling that you're feeling is that you're getting um, yanked up out of the character level a lot and into the mechanics. Now, I personally, because I also GM constantly, um, I love Powered by the Apocalypse for that, right? Like I, 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 I thoroughly enjoy... Um, as a player, I enjoy doing it because I, I, I'm actually really comfortable playing in that game, that game level. And as a player uh, or as a GM, I like it because um, it offloads a whole bunch of work from me, right? <laughs> like it, it offloads a bunch of cognitive work onto the players. And that's not to say that I'm lazy about it. But what's more interesting is that I don't know what they're going to pick. Right. And I have to like play through whatever they like give back to me. So there, there you're so, actually expanding the creative uh, arsenal available to you by 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 involving them. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, so the, but the payoff for that is um, that because each person becomes at times like their own little GM, um, you uh, when you're playing it, it feels different from playing something uh, like like you said, like it feels different than playing like Warhammer um, first edition, which, by the way, is so awesome. Like what a, <laughs> that was my like, game for yeah, years. Yeah, what I ran every rat, Saturday. Six rat hours. catchers, rat oh, catchers forever. Rat man. catcher was, with a three legged dog. Yep. So, yeah. So but th- but that's that feeling is 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 the is the popping up out of out of level is at uh, the levels. Fascinating. Now, so for you, anyone listening okay. at home, for anyone listening at home, you really guys really have to check out Phil's show, Misdirected Mark, Phil, Chris, and Bob. They talk about this kind of stuff all the time. This is basically what their show is about, is diving into the design, mechanics, and theory of games. Like everything Phil just said is like one part of an episode and probably multiple episodes where they talk about different levels and pillars of role-playing. Fascinating show if you're into role-playing games at all. Now, I was wondering... Based on your description, what I and and the the people that you play with, I know uh, who I who I've now met from QCC with um, the gang on on Tuesdays and Senda. Do you feel, or would you say that possibly PBTA is uh, more of a GM's game? Because I mean, I, I think pretty much almost everyone you play with GMs as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's. Um, I I would say it's either it's either a GM's game or it's. Um, I would sometimes Chris likes to call them as like uh, writer writers room games where like we're all taken apart in kind of you know coming up with the story. Thanks. So I've personally gotten to play H two O two and a half times. Uh, once was a story you called Broken Main. Uh, mm-hmm. The other was called Coming Up Short. Uh, Sean played coming up short as well. Uh, I also signed up for a game at Origins, which I was going to get to try the Hydro Hack itself, but that unfortunately didn't pan out. I did get to see it. We just didn't play through it. Right. Now, the one thing with all these games I played, Sean's played, uh, it's been at cons, and they're all one-shots. And most of the time, when you're talking about running H2O, it's at Gauntlet Con or it's at QCC. It's all been one-shots. Now, I own the game, and I've read it, and the game very much seems to be written to be a long-term campaign game and not a one-shot. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that, that's actually right. So um, what is the difference? Like what, what, so what, what have we missed, I guess, is a, is a way to ask the question. So having played it at cons, I got to see part of it. What, what are we missing out on that fans of the game, if they pick up the ash can or people who are trying the game for the first time, will see that we did not get to see? Right. So um, so what you see in the campaign is the neighborhood. Um, it's the part that really um, take like you can't express it in a one shot. So uh, in a one shot, you know, I always write the one shots to be like, there's a problem in the neighborhood. Go fix the problem in the neighborhood, um, which which is great. But the idea is that um, in the ash can and there's a whole chapter dedicated to this after you've made your characters. There's um, a playbook, so that's what um, that's what the characters are called, in, like in Hydra Hackers, uh, or in Powered by the Apocalypse games, the playbooks, right? So after you've made your characters, there is a separate playbook to make your neighborhood, and uh, you make your neighborhood from the ground up, like you decide where it is, uh, you decide what to call it, um, and then it leads you through, like you just follow through the sheet, and it tells you, like. Um, what it asks you, like, what kind of neighborhood is this? So, like, maybe your neighborhood is uh, a sunset neighborhood, which means like it was once great, but like now, like times kind of moved on. Uh, you also pick some tags. So, like, is your 
Um, is your architecture eclectic? Is your city dirt? Like, is your neighborhood dirty? Um, is it friendly? Is it, um, is it friendly? Is it insular? Those kinds of things. And then there's some moves like the, um, the neighborhood has a move that it grants to the players that usually helps the players out. Like there's one called rummage sale. Like if you're looking for, if you're looking for gear or equipment, you can go to the neighborhood and see if they have it for you. Like you, you can just go through the neighborhood and somebody would be like, Oh no, I got one of those. Like it's back in the back room here. Go ahead and borrow it. Cool. And so then the rest of, so what happens is in a campaign after you have played a story. So essentially like the, the one shot after you've played the story, um, there's a whole bunch of things that go on in the neighborhood uh, and the neighborhood has its own stats and those stats are kind of um, propped up with these water tanks. And at the end of each story, uh, the water tanks start to drain a little and you get a little bit of water, but you don't get actually enough water to keep everything at the status quo. So you kind of run around spinning plates and it, it so now it gets into like a little bit like power grid, right? Like a simple, like it's a simple oh, version nice. of power grid, right? Cause it's a resource management thing. Like you only have so much water and these things are ticking down and I'm, I need to put some water here. And uh, we would like to start a, you know, what's called a, um, uh, you want to advance the neighborhood, like you want it to be better. Mm -hmm. So you can start these projects, um, these renovations that actually make the neighborhood better, but they require more water. And so ultimately what happens in the campaign is that when you want to improve the neighborhood, you have to go steal more water because the, the water authority, the group that controls water will never give you enough to prosper. They'll just give you enough to string you along. So when you want to prosper, the players have to kind of kick into action and go steal some more water. Okay. And that's where a local 666 comes in. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The devil's plumbers. So we, we haven't actually mentioned that yet. Um, who exactly is the water authority? Obviously, they're the, the bad guys. If we're the Robin Hoods, they're the, the sheriff of Nottingham. Yeah. So uh, so this game is U.S. centric, right? Uh, for now, I will say I will also for Canadian listeners, I will explain the Canadian version uh, in a moment. But um, the game is the game defaults to playing in the U.S. And the water authority is the corporate um, agency slash corporation that uh, the U.S. government has that controls uh, the protection and flow of water. So they make sure that the citizens get water. Um, but they also then police water to make sure that um, that no one's stealing it, that no one's trying to rip each other off. Um, or more importantly, that um, the rich people who pay more to get better water, um, that they are not um, infringed upon. Mm. Um, because uh, and I usually say this, I think you both you've both heard it if you've heard me intro the game. But the water, water authority is the worst combination of a government agency, a cable company and a software company yeah. rolled up into one. <laughs> Um, so yeah, they're pretty awful. Now I, I will say when, when this game goes to Kickstarter that Jason Pitt has offered to write, uh, the Canadian version, the Canadian setting. Nice. Um, and I'm trying to remember, I try to say it correctly so that all my Canadian friends will understand. So his pitch to me was that water will be like healthcare. So like essentially everyone has it dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Okay. So you that guys get that. makes perfect sense. Yeah. Okay. Yep, we get it. We get it. It's good. So on this interview, you mentioned it. Um, I've heard you also note in other, uh, on other interviews and uh, live when we were playing that the water authority in your game is not the empire. It's there unstoppable there. It's a true distort dystopia. The, and one that the players aren't meant to fix. Mm -hmm. How do you discourage the star Wars mentality? The group of players that gets this game and it's like, Oh, all I want to do is overthrow the water authority. Yeah, I feel like at some point I'll be pressured into writing a supplement, but um, but in the game, um, so in the so there's a couple things. Uh, first of all, um, first of all, the authorities' stats in the book are kind of like they're not ridiculous, but they're not good. Like you are not encouraged to get into a gunfight with the um, enforcement officers, which are like the shock troopers. Like you every. Um, even in the setting material, like this, the guy, like the character who's writing the setting material just tells you to like run, like just <laughs> run for your, you know, like just run when you see them. Um, so yeah, so they are, um, they're made to be that oppressive. And so then the other thing that the game does subtly is that it keeps all the action in the neighborhood. 
So um, you can have your minor victory, right? Like you could torch the water authority offices in your neighborhood. I mean, there'll mm. be consequences, but like if you want to strike that like sl- that small blow for victory, um, it's possible. But yeah, the scope of the game is not about um, overthrowing the. Um, it's not yeah. So you're not supposed to blow up the Death Star. You are. Um, you right. are supposed yeah. to make sure your neighborhood ekes out its survival. Okay, I gotta admit, I love it. Like we were talking about Warhammer Fantasy roleplay, and the thing that always loved about warhammer fantasy roleplay is i loved that warhammer was not about winning it was about surviving the next day Mm -hmm. the main core feeling in warhammer is chaos will win everyone is corrupt you just need to get by and you all you care is the small victory i stopped this cultist today and now i get to eat tomorrow or we get to live more likely or my family gets to live i love that about warhammer i like the the feeling of the little guys fighting back just trying to strive so that is something that directly Drew me to Hydro Hackers when I first heard about it. No, th- I mean, thank you. Like, that was, I mean, I've had that feeling too. Like, I, I like grittier games and I really like okay. the idea, like, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to struggle and we're going to, like, barely, like, we're going to have a close call or whatever. And what it really just means is, like, everybody in the neighborhood will just be a little better tonight. Yeah. That's and that, awesome. Yeah. I, and I love that. I, and I, I really felt that. And that's why I ended, I ended up going with that barbershop character I did uh, in the Conic Houston. You know, I, I, I had that. Um, I don't know. Maybe I was channeling my inner uh, iron, uh, or not iron fist, uh, Luke Cage. Uh, but I yep. just wanted, I wanted that. You know, little barbershop where people could go and feel safe for a few minutes, even if when they walked out, back outside, it was doom and gloom, and and they were going to, you know, be affected horribly. They could at least have a, a quiet place to uh, to calm down and, and be at peace for a bit. Luke Cage was definitely an influence. Like. The um, in the first season, the episode where like Luke Cage cleans up the neighborhood, you know, when he's like doing mm-hmm. all those like, like that was very, watch. yeah, like that was yeah. The neighborhood watch playbook is uh, basically Luke Cage. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Speaking, speaking of so influences, I, actually... I, I gotta know just based on the on the rough concept, how many times have you watched Solar Babies? Not in like forever, right? Like, <laughs> they're like right. two things that people always ask me: Solar Babies and Tank Girl. Right. And like, I think I saw Tank Girl once in the '90s. Oh, and the other one they always ask me is the Water Knife, um, well, I which I started I reading. Know. It's a sci-fi book. Um, and once I started reading it, I was like, I stopped reading it immediately. Like, I I started reading the book, and then I was like, Oh God, there's like a lot of things that are a lot like about like they track really closely to the game. I was like, I'll read this when I'm done writing right. it. Wow. Like. I don't want to yeah. cross contaminate. You don't want to skew Makes it. Makes sense. Yep. Nope. Yeah. I thought maybe you saw Waterworld and hated it so much you just wanted to create the opposite world. <laughs> yeah, it so it actually it's really funny. It's um the way the the way the world got started was it started as I was developing um I was writing this fate cyberpunk toolkit with with Chris and we were playing it out and um you know, I live in Buffalo, so I love I love the Rust Belt. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to, you know, my cyberpunk dystopian, the Rust Belt is like now popular again, right? Like what's old is new kind of thing. And I made a passing joke that, oh, the lake is covered. Like the entire lake is covered with this thing called the skin because, you know, that much free, that much fresh water can't be trusted to people. And that was it. Like I just, yeah. it was a passing reference. And so as we were working on that game, um, it was like really like a generic toolkit and we were having a meeting about it and... um one of my partners was like, don't, we shouldn't do a generic toolkit. Generic toolkits don't sell. Like you should do a setting. And, um, mm-hmm. and I was like, okay, I'm like, I, and I had just read like this article, um, that summer about, uh, there was a huge drought a couple of years ago in, uh, in California. And I, I'm sure, and I know there's Canadian versions of the story, but I'll tell, I'll tell the American one, this huge drought in, um, uh, in California. And uh, there was a company, I'll, I won't name names, but there was a company that like was pumping their water aquifers to fill their bottled water. And they were like, well, yeah, it's a drought, but like, you know, we had it. We got to sell our bottled water. Like and they just like, mm-hmm. you know, they didn't stop production. And, you know, yeah. I had a kind of strong feeling about, you know, privatization of water, like giving water rights to corporations because, you know, that seems like a terrible idea. And that was it. Like. Mm-hmm. So I brought it up to my partners and they were like, you should make that into a setting. And I was like, really? Like, you think that's a setting? And like, we started messing around with it and lo and behold, like, it's a setting. 
Yeah, there's so, a there's a company oh. in Ontario that is pumping uh, <clears throat> at uh, five hundred and thirty two dollars per million liters. Right. Right. So it sounds like this has been in the works for a long time. How long have you been working on Hydro Hackers? Uh, so when it came out at, so when the book came out at Queen City Conquest, that was two years. Okay. So it was two years, and I ran the first play test of the Powered by the Apocalypse version at Queen City Conquest 2016. Cool. And now from, so your two years, two years to get your ash can out. When are you looking at, I'm assuming it's a Kickstarter release. When are you looking at that? Yeah. I, so I'm taking a little break to write Turning Point. Um, so Senda and I are working on Turning Point. And I, I wanted to get that moving. So I think sometime summer or fall, I'll finish up what's left on the ash can and uh, we'll start putting the Kickstarter together. So back to the ash can. I finished reading my copy yesterday. Uh, one thing stuck out that I thought needed some clarification. So in the mm -hmm. section it says GMing Hydro Hacker Operatives, you discuss the core loop of H2O. There's something that you'll hear all the time on the Misdirected Mark show. Uh, one of the things you noted was that the core loop is different from the full game, but you never actually explain what the difference is. So first off, I really dig the concept of a core loop. Like I like that. I, that's, that's a good terminology. We'll put it that way. Uh, I'd like you to clarify core loops. And second, what is the core loop going to look like in the full version of the game? Sure. So the core loop of a game, um, and this can be the core loop of a role-playing game. It can be a core loop of a board game. Um, but it's the set of activities that kind of basically encapsulate like one cycle of the game. So um, in a role-playing game, like if we're, if we're going to look at like Dungeons and Dragons, like the core loop of Dungeons and Dragons is like go to a dungeon murder a bunch of stuff, take all their stuff, go back to town, level up, right? Like that now everybody plays it differently. But if, I mean, yeah. if you really distill the experience, um, a lot of Dungeons and Dragons follows that core loop. So, mm -hmm. um, and I had just heard that, um, we had heard that phrase um, uh, from an, another game designer and, and latched right onto it. So I was very hot onto this idea. And, uh, and, and so... Um, in Hydra Hackers, I'm going to, I'm just going to flip to the book to see exactly what I said about the core loop, how I described it um, in the ash can. I, I'll tell you what the difference is. The difference has everything to do with um, the missing Hydra hack mechanic. So it says um, in, let's see, uh, the core loop is that the neighborhood faces some problems. Characters attempt to solve the problem. Um, the neighborhood is the um, center of the character's world, right? So um, basically what it means is like, there'll be a problem in the ash can. There's a problem in the neighborhood. And then you're going to fix the problem in the neighborhood and you're going to do like the end of neighborhood stuff. And then there'll be a new problem mm -hmm. in the full game with the subsystem for hydro hacking. Um, that subsystem is a thing that you engage like every four to five stories. Like you'll do a bunch of other stuff. And then when you need like a big score of water, uh, you'll go and like you'll set up and do a big water heist. Um, and that's what those mechanics cover. They they cover the setup of the heist, um, and as well as the actual heist itself. Um, and that's the um, that's kind of the missing piece. And in the GMing section, we talk about like how to kind of get around that in the meantime. Mm -hmm. um, but the um, it's the it's the, like the final piece that kind of clicks into that because you'll be like, well, we solve some problems, but then every like four or five sessions, we're gonna go do a big job, so and then we'll come back to the neighborhood. Would it be, uh, to sort of try and uh, classify it, when you're looking at sort of, you're running a, uh, a Luke Cage series, uh, but every once in a while, you need to do a little Ocean's Eleven action. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like that. <laughs> like the Defenders, right? Like the Defenders yeah. show up, like, you know, once... You gotta, once you gotta pull in and, and then big, go away. Go big or go home every once in a while. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. So the other thing the Hydro Track is driven by, as far as I can tell, too, is actually improving the neighborhood. Right, mm -hmm. so the core loop now would be fixed problems, but by throwing that in, you get more into the whole leveling up the neighborhood to use the the trad term. Right. Yeah, there's definitely um, so there's so it much much the same way as characters advance, uh, the neighborhood advances. It's just the mechanism is a little different. So characters advance by getting um, a certain amount of XP, and then they can unlock an advancement. In Hydra Hackers, what you do is you uh, commit to a project. And to do a project, you create, um, basically, it's basically a countdown clock. It's a water tank. 
and you put six units of water in it. Um, and that's not a trivial amount. You put six units of water in it. And um, at the end of each story, there's a move that you do to see how far the project progressed. And if it progresses, the water comes out of the tank. And when the tank empties, um, then your renovation, your advancement goes into effect in the neighborhood. Cool. So, yeah, it, it gives you a way to... Um, it gives you a way to kind of decide, like, like one of the advancements is that you can remove one of the negative tags from your neighborhood. So maybe your neighborhood is dirty and you're like, you know what? We really like, you know, we're prospering. We'd, we'd really like the neighborhood should be cleaner. And you would like come up with like, what does the, that neighborhood project look like? Then you put the water in the tank and then at the end of each session or at the end of each story, you're taking a little out. And when it's done, you get to cross that tag off cool. and now your neighborhood's no longer dirty. It like it's nice, yeah. Cool, yeah. That aspect of the game I really want to try out here at home at some point. So you release this as a powered by the apocalypse game, and you're able to do that because Apocalypse World has uh, some form of open license. I can't remember exactly what it uses. Um, do you plan on doing something similar for Hydro Hackers? Is it going to be an open system? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, yeah. So so the way it works is that powered by the apocalypse isn't exactly. It's not a license like Fate or like 5e. Um, it's more like uh, you acknowledge that your game kind of uh, derives from Apocalypse World. Um, okay. You send Vincent and McGay an email <laughs> and like ask them if is it okay if okay. you put Powered by the Apocalypse on your game. Um, right. And they're very generous, right? Like, um, and again, it's very much. It's not so much as you're copying rules as so much as you're. Um, following that same design philosophy mm -hmm. um so yeah like i mean to pay it forward kind of thing like if somebody kind of looked at some of the mechanics that have come out of this game and were like oh awesome like i would love to do a version of like the sweat mechanic but i want to do it with um electrons because my game is set in cyberspace or something <laughs> like yeah totally like you know just static call it static moves you lose some yeah that'd be pretty cool yeah. oh see yeah there you go <laughs> now we're More playing so what i was wondering though is would other people be able to write stuff for hydra hackers uh yeah i mean i haven't really thought about that part in terms of the ip aspect of it um so i don't know yet um it may be the kind of thing if somebody right. had some passion to do that like you know come find us at encoded like we probably would like to help oh. you with that <laughs> and, and help pay good. you for that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, that's pretty much everything I've got. Sean, do you have anything you want to ask? Well, I know first off, I'd like to say congrats on uh, getting the Mithril status on uh, drive through RPG today. Mithril. Nice. Uh, yeah. They uh, apparently, I, I didn't realize this. Uh, Martin, Martin Ralia, the publisher from uh, yeah. engine um, emailed me today, but um quietly uh drive through rpg rolled out two new um two new um you know you know how tiers. like things were like yeah like two new tiers of of um sales so okay. the mithril and the adamantium adamantium levels <laughs> adamantium and um uh never unprepared is now in the mithril level one of nice. uh, only 67 books on drive through rpg to have that's uh, awesome to cross that level. Yeah, so I went Mithril uh, <laughs> earlier today. So I, I wonder yes, thank if you. a recent review boosted that one up. Right? <laughs> that was a that re, that review was great. Like that was um, Thank you. Now uh, speaking, was speaking just of, a, of writing in books, uh, do you have any plans to write additional things that aren't necessarily games but or or could be gaming related or are you uh, so it's focused on that uh, creative gaming thing? Um it, so it's funny because I was kind of talking to Martin Ralia today and we were kind of like, I don't know, like it's been like, you know, five or six years since I wrote Never Unprepared. Like yeah. maybe it's time to write a sequel or an annotated version or like, I don't know. There's some ideas like we were just kind of passing around by email. So I'm cool. primarily writing game stuff now, but um, it's not impossible to say that. Um, there could be another version, like it could be a, a Never Unprepared 2, kind of reflecting um, even my own changes as a GM since I wrote it um, and kind of incorporating things like Im more improv play into, you know, into your GMing style and stuff like that. I, I know, I think 
what could be a great idea, and you're welcome to it. Uh, you could do a you could do, do a second edition of uh, Never Unprepared, but then you could also do a, a player's uh, guide version. You know, because I mean, it, it's especially with the new with this new modern gaming where the players, uh, you know, have to have a level of preparation, uh, not necessarily at, at the GM level, but there's more to it there, and and I think. Uh, I know, especially with myself, I would have loved to have read one before I showed up at QCC because <laughs> I really was not prepared for modern gaming. Um, I, I loved it and I enjoyed it, but it was a bit of a culture shock for me. You know, it's um, it's interesting because I, I, you know, Chris and I have talked about that. And Chris and I have talked about that as well. Like there's there's tons of GMing advice. And then like, I, I don't know, like players get a, like the short straw on this. Like, I don't think they always get like quite as mm-hmm. much advice about like, how are how do you be a really awesome player? Yeah. Like, what are the things you do? Um, because we, I don't know, we, I think we tend to like take pity, like, oh, the GM's got like a hundred. I, I always say on my show, the GM has eight different things they're doing at once. Um, it's an arbitrary number. I don't know really if it's eight, mm-hmm. but, um, but you know, I, I, we, we, we dish out a lot of advice to GMs and not always the same like amount of advice to players. And I play a lot, so like, I, like, I, you know, I agree. Like, I think there's, I think there's definitely space for a book on like how to, like how to be like a real kick-ass player. I know on some of our experiences at QCC, uh, people might have been able to, and and, and cons are again, right? they're a different thing, a different uh, beast. But uh, there's definitely some players who could uh, boost and help in, in in how to play a con game, even specifically. Um, well, I know, I know there was one player who got upset with me because. We were playing uh, kids on bikes. We were playing Loop, uh, Tales from the Loop, and uh, there was a moment where it was like, it was oh no, okay, so we all left our bikes directly where the cop is about to park his car, right? His lights are going to shine on the bikes as he, and the, the other player was upset that we were that I was giving away our our location and, and and you know making it easier for the police officer to find us. But I mean, like, no, that's that's an '80s film. I mean, that's that that fits so perfectly in the game. It had to be that way. Um. And it's just yep. little, little bits like that where, you know, help out the help out the storyteller if they if they missed it or if you see that opportunity to make that setting more complete uh, in the style of game is. Yeah, I, I agree. There's a there's definitely a skill of kind of knowing like um, like it, it's a change in mindset. Like, I, I mean, I remember, you know, like playing in the 80s, like I would never have done anything to help the GM on their on their side of the no. screen, like solve your own problems, buddy. Like we're getting away with this. Um, but in the games I play now, like I absolutely am like, you know, oh, it would make way more sense if like that fell out of the truck while we were driving away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Like, y- yeah, there's there is a there is a shift in in, in that kind of mindset where you're playing more to like, well, this is the, this is the cooler story uh, mm-hmm. versus like, I'm a win. Like, yeah. There's, there's more, sh- yeah, there's I was more definitely, shared storytelling. Yeah. I was, I was definitely trying to win back in the eighties. Oh yeah. <laughs> and that mentality still out there here and there. Yeah. But... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Sean, do you have anything else for Phil? Oh, I think that, uh, that covers that was, I think, all we had handy. All right. Phil, is there anything you want to cover we haven't asked? Uh, no, I think, I think I'm good. This was fantastic. This was a great talk. Okay. Excellent. So that's the end of the questions we had for Phil. Let's go and check the lobby. But uh, it's been a quiet lobby. So, uh, Surprisingly. We had, a, we had a question from last night. Um, and this was, this was done somewhat tum- tongue-in-cheek, but I'm actually a little interested in hearing your opinion. Um, as someone who writes a lot of RPGs um, and plays a lot of RPGs, uh, why did the world need another RPG was the question. But, I mean, and we, we've talked about this a little bit lately, is, is just sort of market saturation and, you know, the reboots of, of, of so much media right now. Uh, you know, what, what is it that drives you to, to put something new out into the world and add to the pile? So... Um... I mean, I think what drives me most is it's the need to tell a certain type of story, right? And truthfully, um, I didn't go and create a whole new RPG to do it. I, you know, I went with an existing, um, 
I went with an ex- existing framework that I thought was suitable, right? Like there are times where um, I think there are times like Turning Point is a game that like we wrote from the ground up. Like there wasn't anything that quite did what we wanted Turning Point to do. So we just built one from from the ground up. Um, but absolutely, like I, I often when I start with designs, start with like one of the core uh, one of the core systems. So I, I love Fate and I love Hydra Hacker. I mean, I love um, love Fate. I love Powered by the Apocalypse. Um, and a number of kind of like, I mean, I've, I used to play Savage Worlds a lot or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I can start there and really just kind of bend my game, you know, to kind of fit that framework, that's great. And, um, you know, if not, okay. I will, um, I will, you know, I'll go do something else. But my, my, my default, my thing is that I'm trying to tell a specific story. So, I only create a game when I'm trying to tell a story uh, that I can't find somewhere else. If I can find it somewhere else, then I'll just, you know, I could just write an adventure or a scenario for somebody else's thing right. and tell my story that way. Cool. All right. Excellent. Good. Good answer. We did get another question. I don't have it in our notes, but uh, Steve D., who was in our chat earlier, uh, saw that you were the one who had asked about different solo board gaming. So we wrote a whole post Mm -hmm. about solo board gaming. And he wanted to know is, do you enjoy solo board gaming and what games have you played and what's your favorite so far? Yeah, I haven't done a lot of solo board gaming. I was was getting into the idea because... um, So I was getting into the idea, honestly, because I... um, I do such a bad job of taking time off and kind of having any kind of recreation. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and while it's fun to like play games um, with groups of people, cause I, you know, I do play a lot of um, RPGs and the occasional board game um, with friends. Uh, that's a social activity and it doesn't really feed. Um, it doesn't feed the introvert in me. Cause I was an only right. child. I, you know, mm-hmm. I, I can be alone. Like you, <laughs> you can leave me alone. I am fine. <laughs> um, so that's where I was like, oh, I need to find like some activities um, that I could do alone. And I've done a couple solo RPGs um, okay. and I wrote a solo RPG, but I was like, I was like, oh, there's definitely board games that are solo. Mm-hmm. Like which like which, which ones like those could be a lot of fun. Like that's the thing I could take to like a coffee house, you know, get a cup of coffee, mm-hmm. sit at a table and just like with without having to entertain anyone else without having to be put yep. on the spot like i can just sit there and just play the game and drink my coffee and kind of like you know kind of chill um so yeah that's kind of what sparked my interest and i mean cool. i figured if anyone would know <laughs> um if anyone would know what solo board games i should be looking at i would just have to come here well, if you're looking for a coffee shop, Gloomhaven is definitely not the go- the recommendation anymore. No, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not. I saw that box. That thing looks crazy. It's insane. It is huge. Thir- it's thirty-two like pounds? Is that thirty-two pounds? Yeah, I think it's. I think it's averages thirty-two pounds. That's with the insert I put in mine. So where like, does that? It, where I worked, I wouldn't be allowed to lift that. That would be against regulations. I, I and I have it on a top shelf now. So. <laughs> so where does it clock? Where does it clock weight wise to ogre? Uh, it, oh, it's close. I have the Ogre Deluxe Edition. Of course I do. With, um, with the lift, uh, with, with the lift warning with, on it, right? Ogre, Ogre's bigger and right. harder to handle. The weights are really close. Like, I, I'd almost have to compare them. Ogre, I, no, Ogre's a little heavier. Because I remember that when I got it, actually, the local gamers bought me that as a gift. I showed up to a Christmas party. I host a, a WGR, Windsor Gaming Resource, Christmas party every year. And we had it at the Green Bean down, downtown one year. And I showed up, and here's this big Ogre Deluxe box. And I'm like, what's this? And local game store owner came over. He's like, it's for you. And I grabbed it. And here, I'm not expecting I want to lift it over my head, right? I'm like, oh, look, everyone I got. I'm like, oh, my God, that was a bad choice, right? And put it back down. I'm like, okay, I'm going to go sit down for a bit. Why don't you guys play some? games while i rest my back so yeah i think ogre <laughs> might actually be a little heavier there's definitely more uh, in gloomhaven like ogre's just bigger like there, there's the cardboard yeah, just, shits are nice big hexes right right there's a lot more counters and stuff in gloomhaven oh that's crazy that's crazy so yeah we didn't get a lot of people in the lobby tonight i didn't know it could have went either way because this isn't our regular night uh just a note if we are hosted by four other people if anyone is watching us on one of those hosted streams, just a heads up. I probably should have said this at the beginning of the show. We can't see your chat. So if you're in there chatting with each other, that's awesome. We just can't see it. So if you've been asking us questions and we missed them, that's why. Just know that you have to go to like the home feed to join in the home feeds chat room. Just uh, something I became aware of last night. Oh, and apparently Misdirected isn't hosting us tonight. I oh, went no? over there. They were earlier. <laughs> oh, okay. Hmm. I mean, 
I don't know. I did a quick check because WearGrader was in the chat room, uh, okay. which is why I'm mentioning this. Okay. So I think that's about it. I we'll do so. one more ding. So this was a great talk. Find more game gaming game night advice at tabletopbellhop.com. Send us your questions over on the website under Ask the Bellhop or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Now, if people want to know more about Hydro Hacker Operative or Phil Vecchio, where should they look? Uh, so you can always find me on Twitter at DNA Phil. Uh, you can uh, always find me on my two shows, The Misdirected Mark and Pandas Talking Games. And you can find Hydro Hacker Operatives at uh, Drive Through RPG in both um, PDF and in print on demand. And we can awesome. even find your book under Mithril, uh, the Mithril standing. The Mithril status for <laughs> yes. uh, Never Unprepared. For Never Unprepared, that's correct. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media, Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. Watch for the Tabletop Bellhop live to your podcatchers at 2 a.m. on YouTube as well. Uh, Phil, is there anything you'd like to uh, plug? Times, dates? Uh, you can always find me live on Twitch. Um on Tuesdays at uh, 8.45 p.m. Eastern, 6.45 p.m. the Queen's time. <laughs> Wondered if you are going to do that. <laughs> well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Now that he's officially checked in, I would also like to invite our special guest, Phil, along with those of you here joining us live in the lobby. Join us in the penthouse suite where we host our Off the Books after show. For Tabletop, Be for Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. I'm Phil. Thank you. And game on. <laughs>